in God's Word. On Sunday mornings, and it's been a couple weeks now, we're going through 2 Corinthians chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We completed chapter 8 like last year, uh, literally, right? And so we're going to pick it up in uh, chapter 9, and we're actually, Lord willing, going to finish the entire uh, chapter today. So uh, if you are there in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 9, I'll ask you to stand if you're able. If not, that's all right. You can follow along as I read. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is writing to the church in Corinth, and verse 1 says, There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you in Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But, verse 3, I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, verse 6. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, verse 9, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray if you would join with me. We'll ask God's blessing on our understanding of his word. Loving Heavenly Father, will you at this time, on this our first worship service of the year, settle our hearts and center us that we're able to focus our attention on you and you alone. Lord, we don't want any distraction to keep us from that which you have for us today. So Lord, we're asking you to speak very clearly into our lives through your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is going to be part four of a series I've titled Money and Giving. Now, chapter nine is a continuation of the Apostle Paul addressing the Corinthian Christians about their giving financially in order to help the impoverished church 
in Jerusalem. And what we know to be true about the church in Jerusalem is that it was made up of Jewish believers in Christ. These were Jews who came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the result of doing that was they lost everything. They had counted the cost and it cost them everything. Their families, their livelihood, their jobs, their businesses, everything. And this is why, for the most part, the Jerusalem church was so impoverished and in such need. Paul had not only written to them about the Jerusalem church in the previous chapter, as we saw in chapter 8, but he also mentions it at the end of his first epistle in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. He says, Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, this was, by the way, Sunday, <laughs> on the first day of every week, which is when they would assemble, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Interesting, he's going to allude to this again in chapter 9, as we're about to see. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. In the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 29, we have yet another reference to the impoverished Jerusalem church. It says, The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. Now, why do I take the time to provide this backstory? Well, the reason is, is because it's going to be germane to our understanding of the context in which this chapter, chapter 9, is written. Absent the understanding, there's certainly the potential for misunderstanding. Uh, some suggest that Paul is misunderstood here because of uh, what one has called his sanctified sarcasm. And there's a little flavor to that and a taste of that and a hint of that in how he says to them right out of the shoot, there's no need for me to write you, but I'm writing you. <laughs> you made a commitment a year ago and I have to follow up with you so that you'll make good on this commitment. He's sort of um, in a sanctified way shaming them via, via his sanctified sarcasm, which I've personally come to appreciate about the Apostle Paul. He was very blunt on many occasions and it was needed on those many occasions. The Corinthian Christians simply had not yet followed through on a financial commitment that they had made one year earlier. And Paul is reminding them of that, saying to them, you promised that you would give. Now this is why Paul is writing them again. He's reminding them again of that which they had promised to do. And what I find interesting is it's not so much that Paul does this. I mean, we come to expect this from the Apostle Paul. It's not that he does it, it's the way he does it. And what I mean by that is he brilliantly, by the Holy Spirit, focuses more on the blessing of giving than he does the giving itself. And so what we're about to see is that our giving blesses first and foremost the Lord. It also blesses the Lord's people. And then certainly, as we're going to see, it blesses us as well. I want to say one thing before we jump into the text. There's only one place in all of the pages of Scripture where God declares, test me. The only place in all of the Bible where God says, I want you to test me in this. In what? In the tithes and offerings. Here's the test. Test me. Well, wait a minute, we're not supposed to. Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God, right? Well, this is the exception. 
This is the only time, the one time, that God says, I want you to test me. Well, what's the test? We're going to test God? Yeah, test me. Just try, as we say here. Try see. <laughs> Sorry. My wife says, don't do that. It just doesn't work for you. <laughs> You'll forgive me. <laughs> test me. And see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on your life that will be so immense, so vast, so big that you're going to try to figure out how to handle all that God gives in return. It's been said that we can never outgive God. And that is certainly true. There is a blessing that comes. And the first one is in verses 1 through 5. And it's that our giving blesses and perhaps better said, ministers to the Lord's people. In verses 1 and 2, Paul tells them that he really shouldn't, and this is where the sar sarcasm is, he really shouldn't have to write them about this. But he is anyway. And it's concerning the ministering to the Lord's people. But he does so, he says, because their enthusiasm had actually, maybe unbeknownst to them, stirred up the majority of other believers. And in verses 3 and 4 he says, he's sending brothers in order that his boasting would prove true so that no one will be ashamed of his confident boasting. In other words, I'm going to send the brothers there. Please don't let me down. <laughs> Please don't let me eat my words. And then in verse 5 he says, he's doing this so that the gift they had promised to give would be ready as a generous one and not one grudgingly given out of an obligation. In other words, this was a get to and not a got to. They were doing this of their own volition, willingly, gladly, joyfully, and even cheerfully. Paul is touching on a very important principle in telling them their willingness and eagerness to give had both blessed the Lord's people and ministered to the Lord's people, but also it had stirred up the Lord's people as well. Now, the reason I see this as a really important principle is that, and it's sad because it's one for which we as Christians oftentimes either totally miss or worse yet completely dismiss, it's that of our example. I don't know if you ever see it that way, especially when it comes to giving. Now I realize and I am keenly aware that we're not a church that receives an offering in the formal traditional way where we have ushers bring the plate or the bag or whatever it is and pass it out to receive the offering. Now again, nothing wrong with that. When I first moved here to start this church, the Lord had really impressed it upon my heart that we would not do that. Not again that there was anything wrong with that, but that I wanted the church to be a church that would give willingly and cheerfully of their own volition. So we've always had for 13 years, 12 years, going on 13 years now, we've always had this box on a folding table <laughs> at the old church and it's still here. By the way, we are going to upgrade. I just want you to know. <laughs> We're probably going to get two boxes and have them on the wall. I do want to get rid of that folding table. It's just a thing with me anyway, <laughs> now that we have this beautiful church. So we're probably going to have two boxes uh, on the, uh, towards the exits. And so one of the unintended consequences of that is we don't really get a chance to see people worship the Lord with their tithes and offerings. When you pass out the 
plate or the offering bag. Now, you do sometimes see people that will go back there and they'll put their tithes and offerings in the agape box. But have you ever thought of it this way? That they're setting an example? They're setting a good example? This is the important principle that Paul is touching on here. You know, when <laughs> we had our first service in here, one thing I had anticipated and noticed was that when we see people worship, we worship. And with this sort of, uh, you know, where the old church was just long and narrow, you know, kind of like my sermons, <laughs> Uh, this, <laughs> this is the, <laughs> so you guys over here, don't look at them now because it would be awkward, but uh, you can see them when they're praising the Lord. And they can see you when you're praising the Lord. And you guys, unless you look over at them. <laughs> but when you see people worship, it has this effect on you, and then you too are more likely to also worship. And is not our tithing, our giving, our offerings a form of worship? Yes, it is. So too does this set the example. When people see people giving, people are more likely to give. And this is what Paul is talking about here. I think that our example can have a profound and powerful influence on other people. And it works both ways, whether it's a bad example or a good example. And this is what the writer of Hebrews says in, in chapter 10, verse 24. He says, and let us consider, key word, consider, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Good examples, good deeds how what we do and consider ways that you can do something that would have the effect of spurring another on toward love and good deeds. It's interesting to note that Paul would tell them to have their financial gift ready as a generous one and not as one grudgingly given out of obligation as one translation renders it. It's interesting because by having it prepared in advance, Paul would not have to then pressure them to give out of compulsion or obligation. But when, upon Paul's arrival, he does not want to have to deal with the offering. Yeah, and think about that. <laughs> the Apostle Paul's personality was probably intimidating. And he knew that just by the sheer force of his temperament and personality and even presence, it would have the effect of putting people in this position of, hey, I better give, Paul's here. He doesn't want that. And I love that about Paul. He wants the sole purpose to be when he gets there to minister to God's people. He wants that taken care of. I have to say, in all candor, that one of the things I love about not receiving an offering, first of all, I'm very uncomfortable when it comes to talking about money. I always have been. And <laughs> um, I don't have to unless we're at a place in God's Word where God's Word deals with money, and that's the only time I really have to deal with money. The only exception was when we were finishing this beautiful church building that God enabled us to uh, build. But uh, I don't have to talk about it. I, you're never going to see a thermometer up on the screen, you know. This is our goal. Uh, you're never going to have a pledge card <laughs> where you have to pledge and obligate yourself to giving X number of dollars a month. That it, as long as God gives me breath and I have the privilege of being the pastor of this amazing and wonderful church, that is not going to happen. That is not going to happen. I want our attention whenever we assemble ourselves together. 
I want our attention to be focused solely on the Lord and His Word, that the Lord would minister to us. Well, He didn't want to create that kind of a dynamic, so He tells them, I want it all ready, so that there's none of that awkward, uncomfortable dynamic when I get there. And there's another reason why I'm doing that. It's because God loves a cheerful giver. And to me, this reflects the heart of God. And would you not agree that God is the ultimate cheerful giver in what He gave us? And Paul's going to talk about that again here shortly. He's going to reference the example of the perfect gift. And it's an indescribable gift. And that is our example, by the way. We should never compare ourselves to what others do or give. Well, I give more than them. How do you know? <laughs> How do you know? I might want to ask the widow about that in the temple that day that Jesus pointed out and drew the disciples' attention to. Our, our example is always the Lord when it comes to especially our worship in giving. Alan Ridpath said this, When God gives grace, He does not reluctantly open a little finger and maintain a clenched fist full of gifts. I would tell you today that God's hands are nail-pierced hands and they are wide open. This fountain of grace is always pouring itself out with no limitation on heaven's side at all. I think of what James wrote, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. He does not withhold anything. If it's a good gift, He will give it liberally, abundantly, not with a clenched fist or grudgingly. He does it gladly, cheerfully, happily. Well, this brings us to our second one in verses 6 through 10, which is that giving brings an abundant blessing to us as the giver. Now, while this should never be why we give, it is the result of when we give. In God's economy, this is how God has ordained it. In verses 6 and 7, Paul uses the analogy of sowing sparingly or generously and reaping accordingly. And then he says that, again, God loves a cheerful giver which implies that God does not love it when we give grudgingly or we give out of compulsion or we give under pressure or we, or we give when it's a got to. God does not love that type of giving. God loves the giving that is done cheerfully. In verses 8 and 9, he says that God is able and will always bless us abundantly. And then he quotes, interesting, Psalm 112 verse 9 about scattering gifts to the poor. And again, this is in God's economy. In man's economy, when you scatter, you have less. In God's economy, when you scatter, you have more. And then in verse 10, he continues with the analogy of a farmer sowing seed, saying that God will increase and enlarge the harvest of righteousness. And it's accordingly, it's proportionately. A couple thoughts here on this. The first of which is the word that's used for cheerful giving. It's in the original language of the Greek New Testament, the Greek word hilaris, which is where we get our English word for hilarious. <laughs> Did you ever think of giving that way? <laughs> could, could you imagine? You're sitting there, and we are a church that receives the offering, and you're sitting there, and you cannot wait for the worship to end so that you can give. 
Can you see me after of that? <laughs> Praise the Lord! I, mean, it's, I can't wait. I am so excited about being able to give. That is a cheerful giver. The one who derives so much satisfaction and joy and cheer and happiness in their ability to give. Last time I checked, it's still more of a blessing to give than it is to receive. And you know what I'm talking about, right? As I'm saying this, maybe your mind will recall that time when you gave. And there was no greater joy that came as a result of your giving. It was a feeling, a high like no other. That's what it means. And that's what Paul is saying. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. It is hilarious. It is, it is hilarious, really. This is, this is hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I give and the more I give, the more I have. The more abundant blessing comes into my life. That is hilarious, <laughs> right? Can I say it that way? I just did, so there you go. In other words, God loves it when we give out of a cheerful and joyful heart that's happy to give to the one who himself gave all. To the one who himself gave himself. Think about that. That's who we're giving to. It's not unto man, but it's as unto the Lord that we give. Jesus shocked the disciples when he says to them, when you give a glass of water to the least of these, my brethren, it's like you're giving it to me. You're giving it to me. And by the way, the next time you give and you're not too happy with the response from the one on the receiving end of your gift, well, just think about what the Lord's response was. It wasn't unto them. It was as unto the Lord. You gave it in Jesus' name, as unto the Lord. G. Campbell Morgan said it this way, It must be hilarious giving. <laughs> giving out of the heart. And here's why. Because you love to give. Not because you're bound to give. Boy, talk about taking the joy out of it. Why is there no such thing as a cheerful taxpayer? <laughs> okay, that's a rhetorical question, right? <laughs> because we're obligated, we're bound by law to pay our taxes. Giving is the antithesis of that. This ties into the second thought, which has to do with Paul's analogy of a farmer who sows his seed sparingly or generously. Now think this through with me. You have a farmer who says to himself, okay, if I do the math, the more seed I sow, the less seed I'll have. So I'm not going to sow as much seed, so I'm going to sow sparingly that I might retain some of that seed. Okay. Now let's contrast that, I'll add foolish farmer, <laughs> to the other farmer on the other side of this equation who says, I know that I have this seed and I know that if I sow all of this seed generously, I will not initially have as much seed. But I'm still going to do it anyway. Why? Because I know that when I harvest the seed that I sow generously, that I will proportionately reap a generous harvest. So in other words, the farmer who sows sparingly initially has more seed, but eventually the farmer who sowed generously has more seed. 
And there's almost a double blessing implied here. Because the Lord says, I will supply the farmer with that seed to sow. And that's where it comes from, by the way. I like how one said it. If you have the gift of giving, and you know who you are, and just because you may not have the gift of giving doesn't mean that you don't give, but some people God has gifted with the gift of giving. It is a spiritual gift. And with that gift, He also gives you the gift of getting, because He's going to supply that gift. When God gives you a gift, He will always package it with the enabling and the ability and supply the gift that He's given you. And such is the case with the analogy, the illustration of the farmer. The farmer who sows generously is going to not only reap generously, but God is going to also continue to supply that farmer with seed. Why? Knowing that he'll sow generously. You think he's going to supply the farmer that sows sparingly? No. No. God will never entrust us with that which he knows that we will not be faithful with. Were he to do so, he would then become party to our disobedience, and God will never do that. This brings us to our last one in verses 11 through 15, and it's that our generous and joyful giving brings praise and thanksgiving to God. You know, some of you, a number of you, um, gave me and my family gifts, some of which were financial, for Christmas. And you know who you are, and God knows who you are. And I just want you to know that not only am I very thankful to you, I'm thankful to God for you. And this is what Paul is saying here. In verse 11, he tells them that they'll be enriched in every way so they can be generous on every occasion, which in turn brings about thanksgiving to God. You know what it's like to be thanked by someone on behalf of another? It blesses your heart. My uh, son just got a job at Mid-Pacific Country Club, where my wife works. She got him the job. Pays to, you know, know people. And um, he's doing really well. He's a really good hard worker, which <laughs> blesses my heart, right? And same thing with my other son. Their bosses, and even their co-workers, will on occasion say to either my wife or myself, uh, thank you. They're a good kid, and they're a hard worker. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what a blessing that is. And, and think about how much more of a blessing it is to our Heavenly Father to be on the receiving end of thanksgiving for you. Wow. And that's, again, what Paul is saying here. Now, verses 12 and 13, he says, they're not only supplying the needs of God's people, but also bringing thanksgiving to God. And through the proof of the ministry, they glorify God. This glorifies God. It's their obedience and their confession, and it brings glory and honor and thanksgiving to the Lord. And then in verses 14 and 15, he says, prayers go out to them, because of the surpassing grace God gave them. And then, in verse 15, Paul thanks God for His indescribable gift. Hang on to that. I want to come back to that as we close. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the best reasons as to why we as God's people should give generously, it would have to be because of those on the receiving end of our giving. Not only will they praise and thank God for the giver, they will also pray to God because of the giver. I like how one commentator said it. 
If you want people to thank God for you, and you want people to pray for you, give. Because that's what happens. They're going to thank God for you. And they're going to pray for you. And I'll tell you, there's one thing I've come to appreciate over the years, especially in ministry, is knowing that people are praying for you. I don't take that lightly. When somebody says to me, I'm praying for you, oh, that is the ultimate blessing, knowing that you're praying for me. There, there are times, I got to tell you, I was in fact thinking about this as I was preparing specifically for the prophecy update today. Saturdays are all out war <laughs> for me. I mean, you can't, you can't even begin to... Under, and, and I'll pray and I'll ask the Lord, Lord, you know, I must be on to something because the enemy really upset right now. <laughs> and in that moment, I will sense that somebody's praying for me. I, I, I can't really put it to words and articulate it, but I, I can say that it's a sense in my heart, in my spirit, bearing witness really to the reality that somebody in that very moment is praying for me. And I cannot even begin to tell you how grateful I am for that. And this is what, again, Paul is talking about here. Not only will they praise and thank God for you, they will also pray for you. Well, I want to close by pointing out something in verse 15 concerning this indescribable gift. Paul was never really one who was unable to describe anything, right? I mean, we, we know this to be true about the Apostle Paul. He was extremely intelligent. He had a crushing intellect. I mean, just in his writing, he had a command of the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic. This guy was extremely articulate and able to communicate and certainly describe. And then in verse 15, we hear him say that he's unable to describe something. And the something that he is unable to describe is the perfect gift. This indescribable gift. What indescribable gift is indescribable for the, Paul, for the Apostle Paul to describe? I know that's not a good sentence structure, but hey. <laughs> the gift of Jesus Christ dying on the cross being raised again from the dead and is even now seated at the right hand of the Father waiting as we are <laughs> for that trumpet to sound and the dead in Christ to rise first so that we who are alive and remain will be caught up raptured up to meet the Lord in the air that is indescribable. And so too is glory. The glory that awaits. Indescribable. You cannot describe it. It would be criminal to try. We see through a glass darkly. It's blurry. It's dim. We can't see clearly. And there's no way that finite can even describe adequately the infinite. But there is coming a day when this indescribable gift will be comprehensible when we're in eternity. Adam Clark, I'll, I'll close with a quote from, says it best this way. Jesus Christ, the gift of God's love to mankind is an unspeakable blessing. No man can conceive, much less declare, how great this gift is. For these things the angels desire to look into. Therefore, he may be well called the unspeakable gift, as he is the highest 
God ever gave or can give to man. And we wonder why God loves a cheerful giver. Why the Lord is blessed and why the Lord blesses and the Lord's people are blessed when we give in such a way. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the indescribable, incomprehensible, unmatchable gift of salvation. Lord, there are no words. And one day there will be worship because you are worthy. And we cannot wait for that day. In Jesus' name, amen.